talked last time about nuclear decays and that there are three different kinds of nuclear decays. You have alpha emission, which is what happens when you have too many um, protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And in particular, what this does is it changes the mixture of protons to neutrons, like it changes the ratio of protons to neutrons. The reason is that when you get stable elements, so if we were to plot this thing here and do neutrons on this axis and protons on this axis, the stable elements fall in this um, valley, the valley of stability. And around the valley of stability are a bunch of isotopes that have varying degrees of stability. Some of them are more stable than others, but in general they all are unstable unless they're right on the valley floor. So here is the valley of stability. If you have an element that is out here on the tail and is unstable, by emitting an alpha particle, which is a helium-4 nucleus, so you have two protons and two neutrons, uh, what the alpha particle emission does is it moves you in a line that is has a slope like this, has a slope like this. So if you have too many protons in your substance, too many protons in your substance, and you're really heavy, then you will move like this at an angle down towards this valley of stability, the floor of the valley of stability. Okay, that's through alpha emission. Beta emission is that, and that's a beta is when you are off the valley of stability and you move, instead of moving in this direction, you move perpendicular to that direction. You move like this by switching a proton into a neutron or switching a neutron into a proton and emitting a positron or an electron or absorbing an electron. Um, so that's beta emission. These alpha particles are helium-4 nuclei. They move you this way down the valley of stability towards the origin. The beta emission comes to move directly into the valley floor. And then the last thing, so these are electrons or positrons. The last thing is gamma emission. Gamma emission comes from having nucleons in an excited state within the nucleus. So here's your nucleus. You have a proton that's sitting up here. That proton will fall down, and when it does, it emits a gamma photon. So this is a photon. Photon. It will emit uh, gamma emission. So those are the differences between the different kinds of nuclear radiation that we receive. Typically what happens is um, that you have an unstable nucleus and it will do several of these processes. So you start up here, you'll decay by alpha emission, then you'll decay by beta emission to get onto the valley floor, but then you'll decay by alpha again, and then you'll move back this way. So you might start with uranium and eventually you'll work your way down to lead um, by doing some sequence of both alpha emission and beta emission. Maybe you'll do two alpha emissions and then a beta and then another alpha and then another beta um, to land on the valley floor where you have all the stable isotopes. So that was what we had from last time and that reintroduces us to these three types of radiation that you get from uh, nuclear decay. The probability of a decay happening depends upon what's the energy difference between the energy difference in the nucleus between where you are and what element you will decay into. The farther away from the equilibrium or the farther away from the ground state that you are in terms of the, the nuclear binding energy per nucleon, the farther away you are, the shorter your life will be. You'll decay more rapidly towards the center. The closer you are to this valley floor, the longer it will be before you decay. Uh, there's also something related to how easy is it to go through the transition. So some elements, um, it's a fairly straightforward mechanism for them to emit an alpha particle or to emit a beta, and other ones it's a bit more difficult for them, and so that also inhibits them. Okay, once you have this emission, these, these three kinds of emission, uh, all of them can cause bodily harm. Uh, because they typically will come out with high energy. And because they come out with high energy, it means that they can cause, um, dis you know, mess up your proteins, like the formulation of proteins, mess up your DNA, ionizing radiation, causing free radicals to go around the bloodstream, all sorts of problems. Uh, however, some of them are easier to stop than others. The easiest things to stop are alpha particles. Um, if you have an alpha emitter, you can basically just wear a pair of gloves and the alpha emitter will not be able to emit alpha particles that go through the gloves. A, a, sheet, a piece of tin foil is enough to block alpha particles. Th those are really bulky. Um, they come out, they'll run into things, and they'll bounce off. Even your, so even just clothing is enough to shield you effectively, um, not completely, but if pretty well, from alpha emission. Uh, photons, 
those it depends upon what it is they're running into but photons generally will leave your body and just go off into oblivion so uh, if you are near a photon source some of those photons can be absorbed and that will cause problems but other photons will escape and um, they ultimately aren't uh, aren't as harmful as beta emissions which are ones that have short travel distances and are readily absorbed uh, by substances. So there's a an analogy where if you have three cookies, um, one that emits alpha particles, and I stole this from the Illinois energy professor, one that has beta particles and one that has uh, gamma particles, so it, like it has an emitter of each of these kinds, and you have to eat one, you have to sit on one, you have to throw one out the window. The answer is that you eat the photons because then the photons will leave your body and not be absorbed by the body. If they're leaving your body, then they're not being absorbed, which means that um, they're not causing any damage. If uh, the alpha particle you can sit on because your clothing will block the alpha particles from getting into your body, and the beta one you throw away because it will be absorbed by the body more readily than either of the other two and uh, cause the most damage. And now it's time for cookies. Anyways, so those are the three kinds of emitter. Now we can use this information to do uh, what's called nuclear medicine, and that's what we'll be talking about first. So nuclear medicine, there are a variety of types of imaging that people need to do uh, in order to properly diagnose the ailments that others suffer. So when you go to a, the doctor's office, you'll get some, you may get some kind of scan. Now some of those things are just x-rays, uh, just x-rays. So you have an x-ray emitter, x-rays have the property that they will go through light materials uh, if you have stuff with a lot of hydrogen in it, so like this, for example, is a substance that has a lot of hydrogen in it. Um, your body has hydrocarbon chains, right? So you have some some chain that looks like this. Uh, maybe it's got something that looks like that. And it was your sugars and things like that. It has a lot of hydrogen in it. Um, X-rays will generally pass through this kind of material, but they don't pass through heavier stuff. They don't pass through like calcium. So if you have an X-ray emitter, uh, X-ray is not a nuclear source, although um, I mean you can get some X-rays, but typically X-ray photons come from transitions deep inside the atom. So an X-ray is a type of photon. Um, for if this is your atom, like this, you know, it's some it's not hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't emit X-rays, but you can have it um, be like oxygen or something like that. Um, if you have transitions that are out here in the hinterland, these ones are going to be like visible or infrared. Um, transitions that are up here in these high orbits. However, if you have a transition in the in an oxygen atom from the say the second excited state to the first excited state where you're really close to the nucleus, then you get a large burst of energy, and so that will typically be like X-rays. So the the deep um, transitions, the transitions deep inside the atom, are going to be the highest energy transitions, and transitions towards the fringe of the atom are going to be lower energy transmission or uh, emissions. Anyway, so you have an x-ray source, um, or you can generate x-rays with some type of device. Those x-rays will typically pass through these materials uh, without stopping, but when they hit calcium, then they do stop. So then what you do is you just say, well, I want to take a look at the bones. And so you put a photographic plate down here, you lay your hand on it. Here is someone's hand like this. Uh, and then you have your x-ray source up here. The x-rays will come down and, um, uh, they will pass through the water, but not through the bone. And so when you're done, you will expose, the water will be exposed, but the bones will not. Um, and so your, your bones, because they have a lot of calcium in them, will block the x-rays and not expose the film while everything else uh, does not block. I mean, it blocks some of the x-rays, but not all of it. Uh, like all of these things are gonna block some fraction of the x-rays, but it's a small amount compared to what calcium will block. So then you expose the paper and where you have flesh, uh, you get one effect and where you have bone and iron and things like that, you get a different effect and so you can see things. So that is just x-rays in general. It's a profile picture. It's like a two-dimensional shot. There is another uh, thing called a CT scan or a CAT scan. Um, and this is basically, it's what? Something, something tomography. So, blah, 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 tomography. Let me look it up real quick, just so that I can make sure that I get the right thing. The book that I'm using in this case is uh, Physics and Technology for Future Presidents. Um, what does 
CAT scans is something computer aided tomography. I think it's computer aided tomography. And a consequence of this computer aided tomography is that you're able to map. So tomography means to map. So computer aided tomography uh, is a set of x-rays. Yes, a set of x-rays where they take different projections. They like fire x-rays at different slices so that they can reconstruct uh, what's going on. So instead of getting a single profile picture, you get many, many pictures and then you line them up uh, so that you can um, reconstruct what's going on in three dimensions instead of just a two-dimensional profile. So if you're just doing like someone broke their arm, you need to see what it looks like, then uh, an x-ray image is good enough. But if you have to really understand what's the three-dimensional structure of something um, that needs repair, then a CAT scan or a CT scan. So computer-aided tomography, and again, tomography means to map. There's another type of imaging that is frequently used, and that is uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, I think that's what it says. Yeah. So magnetic resonance imaging. Now this used to be called back in the day NMR. MR. So NMR was nuclear magnetic resonance, and then uh, nuclear sounded really scary because you know you don't want to use certain words. So they dropped nuclear from NMR and made it MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, even though it's still nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. What happens here is that uh, when you have a proton, so here is a water molecule, for example. Here's a water molecule. You have a proton here, you have a proton here. They're hydrogen atoms, but a hydrogen atom is basically a proton. You have this proton, you put it in a strong magnetic field, and that will cause the proton, um, it will align the proton in a given direction. So the proton is aligned like this. So all these protons are going to be lined up with the magnetic field. Then you hit these protons with a radio frequency that causes them to resonate, causes them to spin, or they're, so they have a spin that's aligned with the magnetic field, but it causes the orientation of that spin to also spin. So this thing is going to start spinning around. The protons are going to start spinning around because they are driven by this um, electromagnetic field that you're bringing in. So they're lined up with a magnetic field. Then you send in a bunch of uh, radio frequency waves, electromagnetic waves, and that will cause these things to spin at the frequency of the waves that you're sending in. So you send in an RF frequency specifically designed to rotate or to oscillate um, these protons at the frequency that they like to be oscillated. So it likes to spin around at some rate. So you send in a radio frequency signal at that rate and it will get these things to spin. What then happens, now, now that they're spinning, they're also going to be um, emitting radiation. And you can see uh, where, that radiation, where that radiation is coming from. This works where you have lots of hydrogen. So the x-rays, CT scans and stuff like that, what you see is the absence of hydrogen. What you see with NMR is the presence of hydrogen. So this is what gives you flesh wounds. So if you want to understand what's going on with the flesh, then you use NMR or MRI because that is specifically targeting where there's lots of hydrogen. And so where there's water, there's lots of hydrogen, where x-rays will typically give you an image of what's going on where there's no hydrogen. Anyway, so that is magnetic resonance imaging. The third type of medical imaging is called a PET scan, uh, PET scan, which is positron electron tomography. So uh, tomography, again, is to map. So positron electron tomography. Here what you do is you take a pill. So say you've got something that's going on. Maybe you need to image what's going on in your lungs. So for your lungs, you wouldn't take a pill, but let's, so let's do your lungs first. So you have your lungs. You wanna understand what's happening inside your lungs. Are there things that are blocked or whatever? What you do is you breathe in, you breathe in some radioactive element. You breathe in a radioactive element that emits beta particles. Okay, so you breathe in, say, oxygen or molybdenum or technetium. Um, you would choose something that uh, you'd probably use like oxygen to do this. So you breathe in oxygen 17 or something like that. You breathe it in and it's going to be a beta emitter. And uh, in particular, you want something that's a beta plus emitter. You want something that emits a positron. So here's you. 
Okay, here's your chest. Here is your here are your arms, here are your legs. It's an amazing picture. You breathe it in. At this location, you breathe in this uh, stuff that's going to decay. It's going to decay by emitting a positron. That positron is going to find another atom uh, nearby. It's going to move through your body. It's going to find another atom nearby, in particular one that has an electron. And the positron, which is a, uh, so a beta plus is an E plus, is going to find this electron and it's going to annihilate and it's going to produce two photons. And those two photons are going to go off in opposite directions. So you're going to get a photon that comes off this way and a photon that comes off this way. And then you surround yourself with a detector and that detector is going to be like, oh, I detected something here at a given time and I detected something here at a given time. And that's going to isolate uh, where this thing uh, was emitted from, where that pair of gamma ray photons, so you get two gammas off of this, two photons come off of that from the annihilation of this electron-positron pair. And so you, all throughout your body, wherever this stuff gets concentrated, wherever this radioactive material gets concentrated, is going to emit uh, these lines, okay, because they're going to come off in a random direction, but they're going to get these lines and it's going to, you'll be able to reconstruct uh, where each of these things originated from and therefore map out what's going on in you know whatever part of the body. So for example, if you want um, if you want your lungs, you'll breathe something in. If you want to get your thyroids, uh, then you might swallow a radioactive pill, a pill that has some radioactive substance that tends to accumulate in your thyroids. So I know that um, iodine accumulates in your thyroid. And iodine, I don't know that this is what they would use, but let's pretend for a moment that it is something they would use. So. Uh, iodine goes to your thyroid uh, fairly for some reason your body puts it there and so you'll take a pill with this radio with radioactive iodine in it and it will accumulate in your thyroid and then you get the emissions coming from your thyroid and so they can map out what's going on inside the thyroid is it swollen does it have weird stuff in it is there a part that's dark so you have like healthy thyroid here for example or healthy gland um, and you have unhealthy part right here and so when you look at an image you'll, where it's healthy, then that medicine will have, I mean, medicine, that pill, the substance, the radioactive substance will have gone throughout the thyroid wherever it's healthy. And so you'll get emission coming all through here. However, in an unhealthy part, you won't get, maybe there's no blood flow there. Maybe, you know, for whatever reason, um, the it doesn't accumulate, that uh, material doesn't accumulate in this part. And so there's no emission there. So you see a hole. And you can say, ah, there's something wrong with your thyroid. There's a part right here that's not working properly. Otherwise, it would have absorbed this substance. Uh, now, it's, let's see if I can pull up a same book. I'm going to pull up a table uh, of what are the types of medicines that you use to do PET scans. Uh, it's this chapter right here, chapter something or other. Okay, PET scans. So let me switch to the camera just the camera here's just the camera all right here are the pet pet scan substances right right there okay with their half-lives so we've got carbon 11 20 minutes nitrogen 13 nine minutes so nitrogen 13 would be a good one to breathe in because um you know it's oxygen 15 is another one two minutes so those are uh things that you can breathe in it will go into your lungs and so you can image what's going on in your lungs uh, if you needed something to, to go through your bloodstream, then you might choose iodine-124. So there's iodine. Um, it's got a half-life of four days. So you could take that iodine pill a few days beforehand um, and then still go in and there would still be a signal to see. Or they have this fluorine that lasts two hours. And so you would they'd be like, okay, in the morning, take this pill, then come in and we'll take care of your scan. So uh, the, you would choose your substance based upon how long you needed to wait, um, if they need to, if it takes a long time to do the imaging, uh, if you have something that only li lives for a few minutes, then that wouldn't be a good one. If it's going to be a long time getting someone situated, um, and so there's a whole variety of medicines that are beta emitters that we use. I mean, medicines isn't the right thing; they're not there to heal you, um, but it's radioactive elements that you consume in order to do enable different kind types of imaging. So if you want to get something in the liver, then you choose a radioactive element that likes to that the liver tends to accumulate. And so you eat it, um, you wait for for your body to digest it and go through your system, it will accumulate in the liver and then you go in and you, you get your scan done. Here are some questions. 
Do I think we will ever get to a Star Trek style scanner that scans you and the doctor can know exactly what is wrong? Uh, we got transparent aluminum already. So that's a great question. The answer is we kind of already have that. Um, all you have to work with with a scan is light. Okay, all of these things rely on light to some extent. So x-rays to produce x-ray images. Um, you've got the radio frequency stuff from the uh, MRI. Um, so that again is um, light. With the PET scans, you're producing gamma rays and that produces light. You only have, fundamentally, you only have four forces to work with. And realistically, you only have two forces to work with, the weak nuclear force and the, um, the electromagnetic force. You can't do a scanner with gravity. So I think that given the fact that we're stuck with the periodic table that we have, um, and you can only make elements out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and therefore the periodic table is what you've got, um, I think the kinds of scans that we have, I can imagine making them smaller, uh, a little bit easier to use, but the technology itself you know, there may be some breakthroughs, but it's all going to fundamentally come down to electrons, positrons, and photons that are bouncing around. Okay, next question. Uh, how much of the pancreatic cancer diagnosis just has to do with the density of the pancreas? That I don't know. Um, you know maybe the pancreas is more dense than other things, uh, but you should be able to, like, I don't know how they diagnose pancreatic cancer, but it, I can imagine them doing a PET scan maybe to, to do that. Uh, MRIs are magnets. They say polar shift will scramble our brains. MRIs don't affect the brain that much. Well, so when you're in the magnetic field, it's a strong magnetic field. So these are not weak magnetic fields in the MRI machines. Uh, they're cooled with liquid helium. They're superconducting magnets so that you can get up to some number of Tesla. And several Tesla is a big magnetic field. Um, the... The polar shift, if, if you're talking about the polar shift, like the Earth's polar shift, the Earth's magnetic field is weak. There's nothing that's going to, it's not the magnetism that's going to affect our brains. It will be the fact that when the Earth's magnetic poles shift, that the Van Allen radiation belts, the trapped uh, particles from the solar wind that produce the auroras, are going to be closer to the surface of the Earth. And so we're going to be bombarded with more energetic particles. Uh, because the magnetic field will get weaker and therefore the Van Allen radiation belts will come closer to the surface of the earth. Um, anyways, uh, let's see. Let's take a look and see what other kinds of medicines are used in, uh, or what other kinds of elements are used in nuclear medicine. So nuclear medicine isotopes. Let's see, isotopes, common isotopes for nuclear medicine. We're going to trust this lumen thing. Uh, look at this right here. Common isotopes used in nuclear imaging include fluorine, gallium. So fluorine, uh, you know, would be like some kind of salt pill that you take. Uh, gallium, krypton, that would be one that presumably with krypton you would breathe it because it's a gas. It's not really going to interact with that much. Rubidium, nitrogen, technetium-99. I know that one's a pretty common one. Um, indium, iodine, Xenon, thallium, so all of these things are different kinds of medicine. That, well, these are different substances that you would eat uh, in order to get them where you need them in the bloodstream so that you can do these kinds of images. My mom is so fat that I need a neutrino beam to scan her. That would, and that would imply also a, a big, a large density. Now, when it comes to how do you get these isotopes, because notice that the isotopes, uh, a lot of these isotopes had modest to small half-lives. Let's see if this shows what the half-lives are. Okay, here's some examples of half-lives. Um, molybdenum technetium-99 is, um, is that one? Targeted alpha therapy. Oh, we haven't even talked about that yet. So you can do, uh, so let me talk about some other um, things that you can do with this and then we'll go into the different isotopes. Now we'll do the isotopes, we're already here. So. Um, and then I'll talk about this targeted alpha therapy. There's proton therapy. There's neutron therapy. So uh, you can see here, cesium, palladium, and radium are also used for brachytherapy. So that sounds like uh, brachy sounds like sounds like it's in your lungs, like uh, bronchitis. I, I could be wrong there, but you know I'm not I'm not that kind of doctor, so I can make up stuff all that I want. Uh, 60 days, uh, 9.7 days, 17 days, 11 days. So these aren't things that live forever. So it's not like you can go out to the 
to a quarry somewhere and mine this stuff. If you want to produce this stuff, you have to like manufacture it. So you have to manufacture these kinds of radioactive elements if you want to have nuclear medicine and be able to do the kinds of scans that we're talking about. Um, here's a one hour half-life on this one. So, and some of them are minutes, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. So the reason, uh, so you have to be able to manufacture these somewhere. And typically, because these are nuclear processes uh, that you're going through, the place where you manufacture them is some kind of nuclear reactor. So when you do, um, when you have a nuclear reactor, some of the byproducts of, and we'll go into this in more detail when we talk about nuclear reactors, but some of the byproducts are these substances. So let's take a look at the composition of spent nuclear fuel. So the composition of spent nuclear fuel, we'll go to, there's images of this stuff. And this is a good one. This is a pretty common, common one. So open in a new tab and we'll zoom in. Open image in new tab. That's what I wanted it to do in the first place. Okay, so the, wow, that resolution is amazing re resolution. Uh, but you can see when you have a nuclear fuel rod, it starts as basically uranium. Um, it's, it's uranium plus some other things that keep it in its form. It's like a ceramic. But the, so the fuel part is uranium, and it is a mixture of uranium-235, which we'll go into detail in a couple days, and uranium-238. So those are the two different isotopes of uranium. And those two isotopes are very different in their nuclear properties. Uranium-235 is not the same nucleus as uranium-238. Chemi chemically, they're the same. The electrons are the same. Um, the electron structures are the same. But the nuclear structures are totally different from each other. They're as different from each other as lead and gold are different from each other. So over time, after some number of years, the uranium-238 will absorb some neutrons. And so it turns into these red components. So this is like plutonium and things like this. This is the long-lived nuclear waste. And the during the fission process, as these nuclei are breaking apart, you'll develop these um, other materials. So as the fuel gets spent, some of the uranium will be um, turned into these heavier things. Other ones will turn into daughter particles. They'll split apart and you have these daughter particles that are not at the floor of the valley of stability, but they're up on the sides. And so they go through beta emission to make it back down to the valley of stability. So these are you can see xenon, molybdenum, so that molybdenum is important, uh, barium. All of these fission products are things that come out. And then you, what you do is you process them chemically in order to produce the medicines that you need. I guess we'll call them medicines, I, since I can't get rid of that word out of my language. Uh, so it produces the medicines that you need to do these images. Let me see if I can get a higher resolution version of that image. Anyways, there is a higher resolution version of that image, but it's just not there. Um, most of these uh, products that we use in our nuclear medicine for these images um, come from reactors, nuclear reactors that are somewhere. Sometimes you can have research reactors, but for the most part, they're made from a, only a few reactors that produce them. Uh, they're, the ones that do it most often are called CANDU reactors. These are reactors that are in Canada. CANDU Canadian Pressurized Heavy Water Reactor. The design here, that the important thing in this design is that it's a heavy water reactor. And this produces something like 90% of the nuclear medicine isotopes come from these nuclear reactors. So that's pretty cool. Um, it would be even more cool if we had more reactors like this because then when one reactor is being refueled and therefore shuts down and all of a sudden the molybdenum supply molybdenum 99 supply in the world drops down by a factor of you know by a third um, the medical industry wouldn't necessarily be quite at the whims of the needs of the electricity producing facilities but anyways that's the way that they are now so when you take this nuclear fuel out of the reactor you separate out the things with short half-life because you may only have hours. You may only have hours from the time that you produce it to the time that you need to use it. And so um, most of the things that come out of reactors, it's not hours, it'll be a few days. Um, in some cases, you can produce the things that you need through an accelerator. So if you need something that has a really short half-life, you'll have a particle accelerator that will excite the nucleus. 
Um, but anyways, all of these things, um, you don't have much time once you produce it. And so, and even you, then you'll produce the substance, it will start decaying away over time, and then you consume you know, whatever you happen to get at the time. So it's pretty time sensitive. Like the, the logistics chain here is not the same thing as like, we have a bunch of computers parked out at sea. So that's pretty near, uh, pretty gnarly. Here is a comment or a question. Deuterium waste from these plants are supposed to be usable in fusion. Uh, so in these plants, the deuterium isn't the waste. The deuterium is actually um, a feature. They need the deuterium to be bound into the water because of the nature of the reaction that is going on here. And so we will talk about these kinds of reactors in a few days. Okay, so that is that aspect of nuclear medicine. There are other types of nuclear medicine. Uh, but with proton therapy, for example, neutron therapy, um, this T T E T, like a targeted alpha T A T, targeted alpha tomography, where you're now you're taking beams of particles and firing them in in order to. Uh, typically, in this case, it's to do kind of a non-invasive surgery type thing. So, like, let's say that you have a, a a tumor. So here is your head, and you have a tumor in your neck. So here is the tumor in your neck. Okay like this. And so what you'll do is you'll go into a facility where they'll have like a neutron, they'll have an accelerator, a particle accelerator, and they will take a beam of particles and shine it in here. And because you're working with, so like, for example, if you're working with neutrons, neutrons uh, don't scatter. They're able to go directly into the nucleus. They can have them come in with high energy and you can have them stop at a certain distance. So you can choose the energy of the neutrons so that they'll stop. Uh, they bounce off a bunch of things the depth at which they have make their first bounce is determined by the absorption cross-section, which is determined by the speed which, with which they enter. So the, the faster they move, they might penetrate more deeply before they hit something, or before they're absorbed by something. The, um, it, it based, it's based upon the cross-section. So the probability of an interaction is not, it's related to the geometry of the system, but it's also related to the speed with which the, the particle that interrogates them come in. So for example, when you put a, if you have a rock somewhere and you have air coming by uh, very rapidly or water flowing past this rock very rapidly, you'll open up a cavity behind the rock. Okay. And so the cross-sectional area of a rock, when you have high velocity water coming in is basically the profile, the, the actual cross-sectional area, the geometrically, the geometric cross-sectional area. On the other hand, if you have slow water that comes in, then the water will flow all the way around it. And so the water interacts with the entire surface of the rock. And so at very low velocities, the cross-sectional area or the, the area that gets interacted with is actually 4 pi r squared instead of pi r squared. So pi r squared is what happens when you have very fast water moving in, you form a cavity behind it, and it interacts with just the, the profile, which is the cross-sectional area of a circle. Uh, you know, the cross-sectional area of a sphere geometrically is the surface of a, the area of a circle. But the surface area of a sphere, when you have slow moving water and interacts with everything is four pi r squared. So when you send in neutrons or protons with different speeds, um, they will interact with the particles in your neck at, um, at different depths. Like they'll have some probability of being absorbed and you can tune the beam so that they're absorbed with a high probability at the depth where you need it to be absorbed. So you, you send in this beam and then you can blast to, you blast apart the tumor cells. Um, so you, you say, well, the tumor's at this depth, and so I'm going to tune the beam, and I'm going to fire it in there, and it's going to start um, knocking these things apart. Uh, there's at a place where I used to work, at Fermilab, Fermilab um, Neutron Therapy. So this is an, an accelerator laboratory um, where they basically smash atoms together in order to study subatomic particles, but because there's an accelerator there, then they open up, they open up this neutron therapy facility um, that was open almost the whole time I was there, right? So it was 3,000 patients were treated at the Neutron Therapy Center, which means what? So we have 30 years, basically. 30 years, 3,000, so that's 100 patients a year, right? Yeah, 100 patients a year, so a few patients a week. This is, you have a beam of neutron that comes in. Neutrons are effective. Let me uh, blow this up a little bit. <laughs> we haven't got to the weapons yet, but we will. Uh, neutrons are more effective at killing tumors than conventional radiation therapy. Cure rate depends upon the size, uh, the type of cells in the tumor, the size of the tumor, and whether the tumor has spread to other parts of the body and the patient's general health. So they set up this chair that's right off of the beam line. So if we were to look at the map of Fermilab, 
Okay, here's the satellite layer. You come in the laboratory right there. You drive yourself down this road until you arrive at Wilson Hall, which is this building right here. So this is Wilson Hall, the main building at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Okay, this building to the side of Wilson Hall, this is the beginning of the LINAC, the Linear Accelerator. So they have, I think it's called a Klystron here, um, which is a weird like 50s style looking things. Uh, let me show you an image of what the Fermilab Klystrons look like. Fermi. Okay, so this is actually where the particles, the beam is actually moving down here. These are radio frequency cavities where they tune the waves. They, they tune the phase of the radio waves as they're resonating in these cavities so that when the particles come in, they get pushed in the correct direction. Um, what I'm looking for is actually the beginning of the LINAC where they produce the actual protons they send down the beam. Um, but none of these images are showing what I'm looking for. Anyway, so Fermilab. Um, in the LINAC, which runs down this building, so the beam runs right down here. Um, it actually runs along the berm. So this is where the beam is running. This is a hallway where they have all the devices that control the, the beam. But the LINAC runs under the berm. But right here in this area is this medical office. So you walk in, it's like you're in this kind of industrial uh, high energy physics lab, and then you open a door and it looks like a waiting room for a doctor's office because it is a waiting room for a doctor's office. And they take, they siphon off some of the neutrons from this beam, or they produce a bunch of neutrons from this beam and uh, put it through a portion of that facility where they can do this kind of um, neutron therapy for cancer treatments. Uh, you can do the same thing with uh, proton therapy. Um, protons are a bit more reactive because they have electric charge, so you'll use it for different reasons, but it will still be coming from some kind of linear accelerator through nuclear processes. Uh, in this case, it's kind of high energy physics processes, but it's still um, an example. It's nuclear physics that produces the, the particles that are being used. And so it, like just another example of how nuclear physics is related to different kinds of um, medical therapies and things like that. Here is a question. So chemotherapy is chemical, right? Um, yeah, so when you do chemotherapy, you're taking a chemical and you're hoping that the it's a poison and you're hoping that the cancer cells absorb more of the poison than the regular cells. Because so you basically that's why when people go through chemotherapy, like they lose their hair, they get really sick because you're basically poisoning yourself and anything that grows rapidly is going to um, consume more of this stuff and cancer cells have a high metabolism and so they absorb, they take a lot of material. And so you poison the cells by ingesting chemicals. Um, radiation therapy is when you're actually using either electromagnetic radiation, typically electromagnetic radiation, to kind of blow the cancer cells to kill them off by hitting them with high energy photons. Um, and then this is another form of therapy, but now you're using particles, a beam of particles instead of a beam of light. Um, can I go over the hydrogen bomb exam or design? Yes, I can. Uh, I will talk about laser fusion and things like that, but that will be on a different stream. But I can do the bomb design when we get when we get to that. Um, if you're a patient, you got a tour of Fermilab from the inside, and that is true, and it's also true. So uh, Fermilab in general is open to the public. There are public places where you can go and see it. Is it an expensive treatment? That I don't know. I don't know how expensive the treatments are for things like this. Let's see. Why did they stop in 2013? Probably because other facilities opened up. They weren't using the... When they did... Uh, it was around 2013 when they started retrofitting and um, the laboratory. Like They closed the Tevatron. Uh, the, so the Tevatron was the main accelerator. They closed that in around this time. 2011, I think, is when it was closed. Uh, and then they, so they were still using the beam, but then they were retrofitting the main injector in order to do um, some neutrino experiments. And so when they were doing that refurbishing, they didn't need the protons to be going around the loop. And so it, they just didn't run the accelerator. Um, so you can only use this when the accelerator is actually running. And so when they were shut down in order to build new facilities, um, they're just like, well, the accelerator is not running. And so then it become very expensive to, um, to do this kind of stuff. You'd be basically turning on an entire national lab to do cancer treatments. So there are um, delib there are facilities that are built specifically to do neutron therapy. Um, it, it's just Fermilab had a place there. The thing had been running almost nonstop for decades. I mean, there may be take a few months off when they need to retrofit something, but the beam had been pretty active. 
But then after the Tevatron shut down, which was the main particle accelerator, they had, um, so the Tevatron, here's the LINAC, it comes over here, it goes through the booster, so this is the booster ring, um, it splits off into two different parts, you get the antiprotons are produced in here, and then they get sent into the main injector, so the main injector is this kind of kidney bean shaped thing. So this is the final iteration of the Tevatron. Uh, they get sent to the main injector and then it gets put into the main ring. The main ring is this one kilometer radius ring. Um, and so once they shut this down, then um, the, you don't just run the LINAC. You, know, you run the LINAC for this big piece of equipment and you happen to be able to do some medicine with it. Um, you would have a much smaller detector or a much smaller accelerator in order to do just neutron therapy. Okay, let's see. Yes, you can see a photo of the sun with neutrinos and basically look at stuff coming directly from the core of the sun. That's pretty cool. Okay, uh, where, where were we? We were talking about neutron therapy. So there's neutron therapy and why you would use neutrons for basically doing um, using a beam of neutrons in order to break apart the cancer cells. All right, let's see. Um, did I cover all the stuff for nuclear medicine? I think I did. Therapeutic uses of ionizing radiation, biological effects of ionizing radiation. Okay, so biological effects of ionizing radiation is you start breaking things apart. You're ionizing, um, you're creating free radicals, like you're stripping electrons off of stuff that can go around and capture electrons off of other things, which breaks bonds, bonds that might be in DNA or some other substance. Um, food irradiation. Okay, so this is an interesting application, uh, kind of medicinal application, is to irradiate food. So you have some substance like eggs and it has, might some small fraction of them is going to, are going to contain salmonella. And salmonella is not something that you want to consume because it makes you sick. And so you want to kill the bacteria so that it can't reproduce. Even if you do eat it, it doesn't come back to life. And so this food irradiation is um, something that happens a lot. And it's usually done um, with cobalt-60, and it looks like cesium-137. So the two sources are typically cobalt-60 or cesium-137. Cesium-137 comes out at about a half an MeV, capital MeV. Um, and the cobalt-60 comes out at about twice that much energy, 1, 1.25 MeV. So this is high enough energy radiation to destroy biological processes. Uh, right, the typical... Um, so this is a gamma emission. It's a proton in the nucleus that goes from an excited state in the nucleus to a regular state in the nucleus and spits out these gamma rays. Um, those, this is pretty high energy. Chemical bonds typically happen at electron volt energies. And this is mega electron volt energy. So it's a million times the binding energy of a typical uh, molecule in the body. And it's probably even more than that because the typical bonds in the body are a fraction of an EV. But either way, so it's a million times, maybe 10 million times the energy um, emitted. And so that does a pretty good job at destroying these molecules that are the complex molecules that are in the in biological systems. So what you do is you basically bring the stuff in, you turn on, uh, you have a copper, or I'm sorry, a cobalt source pop up out of your storage container that contains, you know, that prevents it from killing everything when it's not in use. Um, you expose a bunch of stuff to this radiation and then you retract it and now everything's dead and so you send it out in the world for people to consume. So er eggs are irradiated. Uh, there's a bunch of other things um, that might be irradiated. Here's the storage pool with a radiation source that comes up into the room and does this. Uh, at the time, so back in the day, you may recall after 9-11 happened, so after 9-11, there was the October uh, 2011 anthrax. Okay, so after the terrorist attacks um, in September of 2001, there were letters laced with anthrax that were sent in the U.S. mail to different facilities. In particular, most of them were mailed to people in Congress. Uh, I think there were a couple of people that died in Harry Reid's office. Um, So they came through the mail, let's see, October, this was not even a month later, October 2001, and it was exposure to anthrax. So people had put um, anthrax in these letters and sent them there. And so what happened was, um, oh, this is annoying. Let's go, let's go to Wikipedia instead where you don't have to put up with this stuff. 
Uh, and so what they would do is they diverted the mail to facilities. Oh, it was Tom Daschle. It was Tom Daschle. It wasn't Harry Reid. Um, they sent them to these mail facilities where uh, they would irradiate the mail. So it would kill the anthrax um, things, and then it would send... Um, then they could deliver it. And so the mail slowed down quite a bit in Washington, D.C., uh, because they were diverting all the mail to a facility. I think it was in Ohio where they would irradiate it, and then they could deliver the mail. Um, anyways, that, that caused a problem. Five people died, 17 injured um, from this bacteria. And, well, and then the D.C. sniper went through shortly after this. It was kind of a interesting time to be alive. Um, oh, and then a bunch of people would send mail with powdered sugar and stuff like that in it because they thought it was funny and then they got hauled off to jail. So don't send powdered substances in the mail to anybody. So anyways, victims, Tom Daschle, um, he survived, but his office, there were people in his office and there were, and especially I think there were people in the mail room at the Capitol building that uh, died. So Thomas Morris Jr., Joseph Kirsten, Kathy Nguyen, um, anyways, that was what happened. So most irradiated food, like irradiated food in general, is safe to eat. So the fact that it's been irradiated means that it's safe and that the substances that are in there, the biology that's in there that would kill you, is now gone or now dead. Um, it's not radioactive. It's been irradiated. So if you ever hear like your mail's been irradiated or something like that, it's, that means it's safe. It doesn't mean that it's actually radioactive. Um, none of these things are going to excite the radioactive, the transitions anyways. So, All right, let's see. What else have we got? Do you feel... The treatments to cancer recursively cause cancer if you think time is a whole entity rather than discrete chunks of observable moments. Um, the treatments for cancer are like once you kill the cell that's dividing improperly and you kill all the cells that could continue to divide improperly, then the rest of the cells in the body can handle it. So no, I don't think that um, cancer treatments cause cancer. Well, I mean, some cancer treatments might cause cancer, but it's the question is which cancer is worse and um, at what stage in your life do you develop it? So if you get cancer, some cancer treatment at 30 that increases your probability of getting cancer when you're 90, um, then the intervening 60 years are things that you got for free or that you got at the price that you paid for getting the treatment. So, um, I mean, life is fatal. Everyone who's been born um, essentially has died. And so uh, there's nothing you can do to, do to escape that. The question is, at what stage do you die? So you can do like the integrated life that has been lost in terms of hours. It sounds like there's UV lights to get rid of COVID in public places. Yeah, basically the same idea, except um, so COVID's a virus. It's probably a bit more fragile than um, than cancer cells. They irradiate they radiate ballast tanks and oil tankers to keep from contaminating different floras. Ah, okay, so you have an oil tanker. You have these hydrocarbons in there. That sounds like food to some. I'm sure there's some bacteria that enjoys eating crude oil, and so you irradiate the container and kill off that bacteria so that you don't end up with a bunch of biological, well, a bunch of like bacteria in your gasoline. That's cool. Um, Spices get irradiated before import. That's interesting. I did not know that. If you get cancer treatment at 30, you get... Um, oh, if you get cancer treatments at 30, you get cancer at 21. Now, that, that time is uh, moves in one direction. Let's see. Irradiated food is good. Yes. Kills germs. Um, germs, well, so it depends on which germs you're trying to kill, right? Some germs are, are tasty. Um, I totally agree with that. Some fungus are... You don't want it between your toes, but you might uh, enjoy mushrooms and mushroom soup or something like that yeah so it's a matter of um what it is that you want to preserve and if the biology that you're killing is more dangerous than the taste that you're missing oh the water in the ballast tanks of the tank ship they must oh it's the water not the oil okay i, I misread your thing uh the water in the ballast tanks so you have a tanker you put water in the in these ballast tanks that keep it from like bobbing around you, it kind of sinks it down in the water a little bit so that it's more steady um, water in the ballast tanks, they fill the ship with water when delivering oil, and that water gets irradiated when going back home. Okay, so that I was incorrect in saying this other thing. So they irradiate the ballast tanks. My apologies. Some soap companies were sending free samples of washing powder. <laughs> that was, yeah, for the during the anthrax period. Yeah. Okay, so that's nuclear medicine. Let's talk uh, briefly. Ooh, do I want to do... I think that we're going to have to postpone nuclear weapons. So I apologize for 
Um, so let's do a brief preview, and then we'll cover nuclear weapons next time. So we'll, uh, a brief preview of what we're talking about with nuclear weapons. There are basically three types of nuclear weapons that we need to consider. Um, oh, and we'll consider a few. We will consider, I guess in order, um, a uranium bomb. How to make a uranium bomb, right? It's like uh, that Weird Al movie, uh, UHF, where the guy says, you know, next week we're going to learn how to make plutonium from common household items, uh, which you can't really do because that would require chem that's a chemical reaction, and in order to make plutonium, you need nuclear reactions. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about uranium bomb. We'll talk about a plutonium bomb. Okay, how to make these different bombs. We will talk about an, a hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bomb. We will talk about um, a dirty bomb, which was all the rage. Um, also after 9-11, well, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but 20 years ago, there was this attack. And uh, there was shortly after that attack, so then we had the anthrax thing, then they heard the DC sniper, and then there was the shoe bomber and the dirty bomber. And there was all this rate, you know, everyone's talking about like, what about dirty bombs? Do we need to be worried about dirty bombs? And so we'll talk about dirty bombs. So I think these are the four um, types of uh, bombs that we will be talking about next time. We'll have to do it next time. Um, how to build and what it took to, to make these things. So that's the plan. A uh, dirty bomb like mustard gas. Uh, no, so like this would be a dirty bomb, a dirty nuclear bomb. So the idea is that you spread nuclear material in some area and contaminate it and make it unlivable for a period of time. Um, I'm going to use a VPN for the next lesson. <laughs> All right. So that's, um, that's it for today. We'll come back and we'll address these things uh, next time. So let me answer a couple of questions. I, I just don't have time to go in this today. And so instead of getting started and cutting ourselves halfway through, um, I'll just punt on this one. There are some questions about time moving in a particular direction. Uh, time moves forward in one direction. Okay, so time, we know that time reversal symmetry is not pre preserved. Because there is CP violation, then there must, well, okay, so as long as the CPT theorem holds, uh, as long as CPT is a conserved symmetry, that's charge conjugation. When you switch the charges, you switch the parity, so you move into the a mirror universe where right handed means left handed and use reverse time, um, if you do all those things, then you get the same physics back. It appears by all tests that CPT is conserved, that charge, when you do charge conjugation, parity conjugation, and time reversal, that, um, that physics stays the same. All the interactions are the same. We know that CP is violated, that you can, when you do charge and parity separately, that there are some processes, it's not very many, but there are some processes that violate CP. Um, that implies that there are some processes that violate time reversal, that when you run the clock backwards, you don't get the same physics. Okay, so there are some processes that do that, but that is a tiny minority, like a part per billion um, scale types of interactions that take place. So when the um, otherwise time moves in a can move in either direction, forwards or backwards, and there's nothing really that breaks the time reversal at the microscopic scale. However, we don't live in the microscopic universe. On the macroscopic scale, then you have uh, diffusion effects and dissipation uh, where energy gets deposited in a lot of different environments, and that increases the entropy of the system. So you're taking um, particles where you have a few number of microstates that will produce what you have, you separate them um, into different styles, and then when they mix, um, you increase the randomness. So they call it like order and disorder, you increase the randomness, but it's actually what's going on is you are um, filling up the most probable, you have a given amount of energy and you're occupying the arrangement of particles where you have the most flexibility in producing the amount of energy that's in the system. Um, so entropy increases, and so that goes in a particular direction. There are some people who think about, oh, you know, time is, they think more deeply about this, like Sean Carroll thinks more deeply about the arrow of time than I do, but nevertheless, time ticks forward in some direction, and so there's no way, it violates causality to go backwards in time. Um, and quantum entanglement doesn't violate causality. Uh, you have a single wave function that you split, and then you measure that wave function in, in two different locations. Uh, let's see. Uh, first time here, found it interesting. I stream twice a week, two times a week, unless something comes up. 
And so it is Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon Pacific time when I stream for a couple of a uh, couple hours. So on, and it's always science stuff. And I'm part of a group of people called the Knowledge Fellowship, uh, which is a an ensemble of people who do chemistry and physics and geology. Well, I'm kind of the only physicist, but people do physics and geology and all, si all types of learning type things. Um, some astronomers, Skylius, for example. So these are all things. Thank you for that sub. I appreciate that very much. Um, if I were to create an application that can accurately predict an RGB image through webcam, could you send yourself a message through time? Well, you can send yourself a message through time anyways by um, by putting it in the mail and then receiving it later. But can you do it backwards in time? No, because it violates causality. Uh, in the Cartesian plane, why would negative force by negative time be positive? Is negative... Uh, so in, in a Cartesian plane, um, yeah, the same group Rocket Sage is in. Yes. Thank you for that sub. I appreciate that very much. Let's see. In the Cartesian plane, why would negative force by negative time be positive? Well, so it's like why a negative times a negative, a positive number. It's not, um, it's that time has a sign, right? There's a direction associated with it. So you can, it means something to go forwards in time. It means something to go backwards in time. And so um, that's just saying a negative times a negative in in a physical representation means the opposite of an opposite. So there, there's nothing, I think, particularly unusual about something like that. Anyways, uh, that's the plan, or that's the plan for today. And we will be back on Thursday. Thursday, we will do nuclear bombs. Then we'll probably spend a week or maybe two doing the particle physics cosmology stuff. And then we will kind of do a thing on nuclear energy, uh, and that will take several weeks.